I'm honored to represent the department and my colleagues as the director of its fine symposia series that has established wonderful relationships over the years with donors and other uh, people responsible for uh, these fine uh, programs. This is our 14th annual John O'Sullivan Memorial Lecture, and in my opinion, there's no higher honor than to have a lectureship named in, in, in your honor. Would that we all make such an impression and impact on those we leave behind. If you wish to support our symposium, you have information you received when you came in, or you can go on the web and find us. Thanks, too, to the O'Sullivan family, uh, whose relationship with this department has benefited myself and my colleagues in countless ways. I'm also grateful to the wonderful staff we have in our department, of course, Ms. Zella Lynn, and, and in, the, in, in the college that helps put on this program every year. You all make this lecture an absolute pleasure to put on. Following today's lecture, there'll be a, a Q&A, and we have microphones placed on each side, so if you have a question that you've been thinking about, make sure you move to those, uh, at the conclusion of the lecture, move to the side so you can ask a question uh, and uh, any, perhaps, uh, a comment. One of John O'Sullivan's fields of specialization was in modern political history, as well as in oral history. So it's especially fitting today that our speaker highlights this aspect of John's specialty. And in fact, Dr. Chafe was a contemporary of John's at Columbia back in the late 60s and 70s, although I don't think he knew him personally. But they were both students of the famous, still living at 95, William Luchtenberg. Um, like many of his contemporaries, Bill Chafe took part in the civil rights movement in Boston, in New York, Montgomery, and other cities. After receiving his PhD in American history from Columbia, he began his career at Duke in 1971 and was one of the first new generation of scholars to write about women's history. Along with fellow historian Larry Goodwin, Dr. Chafe initiated at Duke a new kind of civil rights history focused on black grassroots activism in local communities. The oral history program they created evolved into the Center for the Study of Civil Rights and Race Relations, then at Duke at UNC, now the Duke UNC Center for Research on Women with a focus on race and gender. Ultimately, these efforts led to the Center for Documentary Studies, founded in 1989. Named the Alice Mary Baldwin Professor Emeritus of History in 1988, Dr. Chafe serves as the Chair of the History Department, the Dean of the Faculty of Arts and Sciences, and the Dean of Trinity College, as well as Vice Provost for Undergraduate Education. He also served as president of the Organization of American Historians, and in 2001 was elected a fellow in the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. The author of 13 books, Dr. Chafe's prize-winning scholarship is focused on civil rights, history, women's history, and modern political history. Today, he will examine how personality helped shape the politics of many of our modern presidents, including John F. Kennedy, Lyndon Baines Johnson, Richard Nixon, Bill Clinton, and Donald Trump. Dr. Chafe, we are delighted you are here. Ladies and gentlemen, help me welcome Dr. Chafe. I'm afraid I can hardly see you, but I really appreciate your being here. It's a wonderful uh, opportunity to meet and talk with you. I've talked with some of the graduate students and enjoyed that very much. Uh, I thought I'd begin by telling you why I got involved in thinking about personality and politics. Uh, as uh, Steve said, I've been writing about civil rights and women's history, and uh, I was always intrigued by the question of why did people go in a certain direction, especially during the 1960s when the civil rights movement started. And of course, the civil rights movement started as very much incremental reform, working inside the system to try to change the system. But then by 63, 64, 65, uh, more and more younger people would join the movement, and they said, it's really the system itself that needs to be changed. We need to throw, overthrow the system and create a new, a new kind of uh, democracy. So I asked myself, how do you explain why someone makes that decision to either stay inside or go outside? And that led me to the first biography I wrote, which was of one of the most important uh, white activists in the movement uh, who helped actually to bring the first group of white students to Mississippi uh, in 1963 and was responsible for the 
in some ways the idea of bringing a thousand northerners to Mississippi in 64 for the Freedom Democratic uh, summer. His name was Allard Lowenstein. You probably don't even know that name, but it was an extraordinary life who became a congressman eventually. He was very involved with the, uh, the national student movement uh, as well as the anti-war movement and the civil rights struggle. So I decided to write a biography of Lowenstein. His papers were at the University of North Carolina and uh, I thought this was a really interesting way to get inside of someone's process of deciding to stay inside rather than go outside the system. What I discovered when I got into those papers was that this was an incredibly complicated life. Lowenstein was of Jewish ancestry, but really wanted to escape the impact of the Jewish family on his own life. And so he went as far away from New York City as he could to go to college, went to UNC in North Carolina. And then I also discovered that in high school, he wrote in his diary, I need to come to grips with the fact that I like boys more than girls. Well, it turns out that his life was shaped by those two issues, his religious faith, the fact that he was gay but was not ready to come out and say he was gay. And so the biography I wrote really shaped the way in which his life evolved and how he came to be the kind of pivotal figure he was. It's called Never Stop Running because he was always running away from those two issues, running away and trying to not come to grips with them until finally in the late 1970s uh, he came out of the closet. And then later on in the 1970s, actually in 1980, he was murdered. He was murdered by a white activist whom he had made sexual advances to 10 years earlier. So this all got to me in terms of trying to think about how do we understand how personal experiences uh, ultimately affect the way in which politicians conduct their lives. So today I'm going to be talking about these five different presidencies. Actually, in the Bill Clinton period, I'm going to talk more about Hillary than Bill. Uh, and I've written a book about Hillary and Bill. Um, but I'm going to start by talking about John F. Kennedy. Now, we have two images of the Kennedy family. Uh, one image is of how tight and harmonious and together they all were. They ate together. They played football together. They went on trips together. Uh, and this is the most incredibly uh, bonded family you can imagine. On the other hand, you have a father uh, who is traveling all the time, is a very big shot in Hollywood, and uh, who has tens if not hundreds of affairs, sexual affairs, including bringing some of his mistresses home uh, and with the family. You have a mother who is supposedly the embodiment of maternal love, but who had very, very little physical contact with their children. <clears throat> and in fact, at a time when, when you went abroad to Europe, with the, before the airplanes started to fly there, you're talking about someone who uh, was spending eight to 10 weeks on a trip to Europe, and she went to Europe 17 times during the times their kids were growing up. A little bit different from the image you have of um, the completely together harmonious organic family. Now, John F. Kennedy was a sickly child. As his brother Robert once said, he spent half his days in bed, ill. Uh, he had a very dangerous disease, which required medical care all the time. He therefore was not as involved in the dynamics of the family life and spent a lot of his time reading books in bed. Became much more of an intellectual, somewhat more detached, more aloof. Um, he did take from his father a same kind of uh, erotic fixation on women uh, and was known very much for sleeping around, even as a college student. Um, but he was someone who had a very somewhat removed perspective on the things that the other, other members of the family were concerned with, somewhat more distant, somewhat more detached. He was someone who uh, needed the help of his father to get accepted in places. Uh, for example, he, he wanted to be in the military during World War II. His father got him into uh, the military by persuading generals in Washington to let him, let him come in, admirals actually. Um, he had a number of 
one night stands with women. But then, during World War II, when he was in Washington, before he went to the Pacific, he fell in love. He fell in love, probably for the, one of the only two times in his life, with a young woman named Inga Arvid. And basically, she was a person he spent large amounts of time with. And the reason we know so much about the relationship is because she was suspected of being a German spy. And therefore, the FBI had, wherever she was, bugged. So we know about all the conversations that took place between Jack Kennedy and Inga Arvid. We know how much they were in love with each other. We know they talked about getting married. This is something different for John F. Kennedy, who never really spent more than one or two nights with a woman before. And they are that much in love that it's something for both of them that is completely unreal. Uh, and basically, when John F. Kennedy is sent to the Pacific and becomes captain of the PT-109, uh, by that time, Joe Kennedy, his father, has helped to break up the relationship, but they are still corresponding and in love with each other. And Kennedy goes to the Pacific, and as you know, his boat is crashed by a Japanese destroyer, and uh, it's a disaster. And Kennedy is incredibly brave and rescues people and swims with one man's life jacket in his, in his teeth for miles to save that person. And he then writes a letter to Ingo Arvid after that experience. He's very distrustful of the way in which the military operated on that entire occasion. The orders that they gave him in the first place, the fact they never came looking for him in his PT-109 boat, he just had a suspicion about the way in which the military was operating. And he writes her this letter in 1943. We get so used to talking about billions of dollars and millions of soldiers that thousands of casualties sound like drops in the bucket. But if those thousands want to live as much as the 10 that I saw, the people deciding the whys and wherefores had better make mighty sure all this effort is headed for some definite goal. And then when we reach that goal, we may say it was worth it. For if it isn't, the whole thing will turn to ashes. This thing is so stupid that while it has a sickening fascination for some of us, myself included, I want to leave it far behind when I go, far behind me when I go. And he then writes to her, you are the only person I'd say this to. As a matter of fact, knowing you has been the brightest point in an extremely bright 26 years. We know that Kennedy again gets elected to the House of Representatives, to the, to the Senate. We know that he goes to Vietnam at one point and has very, very skeptical views of the French invasion and, 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 and involvement of Vietnam, which he then makes his speeches about in Congress. And then ultimately he becomes president, of course. He has the disaster, the Bay of Pigs invasion. The Bay of Pigs invasion, which in some ways he blames on military leaders who did not adequately prepare for that venture. Then there's a disaster in Vienna with Khrushchev. And then finally, there is the involvement uh, in Vietnam itself. And then the Cuban Missile Crisis. The Cuban Missile Crisis is a fairly incredible moment. Russians are placing ballistic missiles in Cuba with the idea of putting nuclear warheads on them Kennedy convenes a group of advisors on what they should do. They want to attack Cuba immediately, bomb those bases, invade Cuba. Kennedy supports a quarantine instead, and so we have a blockade of the Cuban coast. And then a U-2 plane, spy plane, is shot down over Cuba, and the demand of all that members, those members of the executive committee increase, bomb the hell out of those people in Cuba, invade the island. And Kennedy says, no, I don't think I want to do that. He's the only one beside his brother Bobby who says no. Eventually, Khrushchev writes a rambling letter suggesting a way out of peace. Kennedy takes him up on it. And after many, many, many days of near disaster, a peace settlement is reached. The Cuban Missile Crisis is over. What none of us knew for 20 years was the following. Those missiles were already operational. They already had nuclear warheads on them. 
and the Cuban commanders on the ground had the authorization to fire those missiles if anyone attacked them. If in fact we had bombed those missile bases, nuclear weapons would have landed in Miami, Washington, and New York, and we would not be here today. I think that the reason that Kennedy had that independence and that courage goes back to that experience with PT-109 and the degree to which he had always been a person of independent thinking, independent means. And because of that, he said no. And because of that, we are here today. Lyndon Johnson was very different. <coughs> Lyndon Johnson also had a complicated childhood. His mother was artistic. She loved literature. She curled his hair like a girl, signed him up for violin lessons, basically wanted him to be an aesthetic human being. His father wanted to take him out campaigning on the hustings. He was crude, he was down to earth, he was running for office, and basically he offered a completely different role model for Lyndon Johnson. Lyndon Johnson essentially had to find some way of creating unity out of this disharmony. And so he became obsessed with the idea of bringing people together who were apart. He became obsessed with the idea of developing consensus, of working with father figures uh, in various places in, in his career. Above all, he wanted not to alienate either side. That becomes pretty important in Johnson's career. He becomes obviously a, an incredibly important uh, member of the House of Representatives and then the U.S. Senate. They call him Landslide Linden because he won the Senate race by 87 votes. Uh, and those 87 votes came from a county which reported late in which all 202 votes for LBJ had the same handwriting. <laughs> uh, Johnson was Kennedy's vice president. Kennedy understood that he needed to have Texas to win the presidency. Johnson was not fully involved in all the kinds of complicated thinking about foreign policy that Kennedy was involved with. And Kennedy, by my estimation, was already committed to basically withdrawing the troops from Vietnam. He'd been asked by the Pentagon for 100,000 more troops in Vietnam, and he said no. He reduced the number of troops in Vietnam by 1,000 from 16,000 to 15,000. And he signed an order saying that after he beat Gary Goldwater in 1964, we would withdraw our troops and have peace. Lyndon Johnson did not know that. And when Johnson became president, he did two things. He became the most effective domestic reformer the United States has ever had in the White House, including FDR passing the War on Poverty, the Civil Rights Act, Voting Rights Act, Medicare, federal aid to education. He was extraordinary. But at the same time, he felt compelled because he'd grown up in a Congress where the Cold War was the single thing everyone had to subscribe to. He would never ever raise a question about the Cold War. Indeed, he became part of those uh, people in Congress who punished dissidents within the State Department uh, who raised questions about the Cold War. And so at the same time that Johnson ends up being this incredibly dramatic and driven domestic reformer, he also feels he has no choice but to accept the military's recommendations, including those of Senator Robert McNamara, I mean Secretary of Defense Robert McNamara, to build up the troop, troops in Vietnam. He does this not with a lot of public disclosure, but we go from basically 15,000 when Kennedy dies to 200,000 18 months later, and then to 540,000 by the end of the administration. He basically feels as though he cannot take the chance of being accused of losing a war to the communists. Even though if you saw the Vietnam documentary by Ken Burns, you saw many times where Johnson says to himself, and says on the telephone, 
I don't see how we can possibly win this war. He knows in his gut of guts that this cannot happen, but he refuses, refuses to back out and to change his policy. Lyndon Johnson is responsible for a huge escalation of the war. And for those of you who saw the documentary, the loss of well over 50,000 American lives and well over half a million Vietnamese lives. By the end, Johnson recognized that he had to try to make peace. Uh, but he was, became increasingly paranoid about the people who were, who were opposing him, including Bobby Kennedy, but also Gene McCarthy, including reporters who came back from Vietnam and talked about what was really going on there, calling those people communists. In the end, he could not arrive at peace in Vietnam before his administration ended. And we'll talk more about why that was in a second. But he had this incredible experience talking to his biographer, Doris Kearns Goodwin, who went to Texas with him after he left the White House and started to write books with him. Kearns would sleep in the house. She'd get up at 5 o'clock every morning. Lyndon Johnson would come into her bedroom. He'd get into bed by himself with her, with her, her taking notes and start talking about his experience. And this is one thing he said to her in 1970. I knew from the start that I was bound to be crucified either way I moved on Vietnam. If I left the woman I really loved, the great society, in order to get involved with the bitch of a war on the other side of the world, then I would lose everything at home, all my programs, all my hopes to feed the hungry and shelter the homeless. But if I left that war and let the communists take over South Vietnam, then I would be seen as a coward and my nation would be seen as an appeaser and we would both find it impossible to accomplish anything for anybody anywhere on the entire globe. So Johnson's obsession with consensus rooted in his family background and the huge gap between his mother and father carries forward through his entire life and ultimately leads to the tragedy of Lyndon Johnson being on the one hand, the greatest success in our history in the 20th century as a, as a domestic president and responsible for the greatest failure of our foreign policy, the Vietnam War. Why did we not have peace with Vietnam? In large part because of the next person we're gonna talk about, Richard Nixon. Richard Nixon was a Quaker from a family of Quakers, but he was a very, very isolated, lonely individual. He was not someone you wanted to cuddle, one relative said. Uh, he dis early on displayed an ex 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 incredible memory, but he did not reach out to other friends, other people. He always found a vacant corner in the church to make into a study hall. And even when he went to work with his father in a store, he went off by himself in a corner, very, very lonely. He had simultaneously great ambition and also great fears and thoughts of conspiracy. And as he went on, he was very successful in college uh, and then came to Duke Law School in the early 1940s on a full scholarship. After his second year at Duke in the law school, he was afraid he had not done well in his courses and might lose his scholarship. And so what did he do? He broke into the dean's office at the law school in order to check his grades and make sure that he would be able to stay as a scholarship student at Duke University. One only wishes that someone could have predicted what that trajectory was gonna to lead to. As you know, Nixon had a career which was characterized by simultaneously being aggressively anti-communist. He's the one who really got Alger Hiss uh, in the late 40s as a congressman. Uh, 
um, basically was very conservative in his domestic politics, but because he was a conservative from California, Eisenhower chose him as vice president. The more beneficent side of Nixon comes out in the fact that he was only one of two or three people in the Eisenhower administration who really supported civil rights and actually worked hard for black civil rights. Then, of course, he gets sick in the 1960 campaign, loses the debates to John F. Kennedy, especially those who saw the debates on TV as opposed to listening to them on the radio, uh, and is defeated by John F. Kennedy. He goes off to California, then gets defeated when, the, when he runs for governor in 62 and says at a press conference to the press, you're not gonna have this guy to kick around anymore. But then decides to come back and runs for president in the late 60s. And he runs for president now on the basis of a Southern strategy, working with people like Strom Thurmond from South Carolina and other white supremacists in the South to win the white Republican vote and basically say, no longer is he gonna be a strong supporter of civil rights. He comes out against busing, comes out against the Supreme Court's decision on all these issues. But here's where we come back to Nixon and the patterns he had as an individual. Correctly, we generally think of the presidency as an incredibly busy, incredibly difficult job with appointments coming one after another all day long, meeting with tons of people, leaders of Congress, members of the cabinet, officials, et cetera. For the most part, Richard Nixon never met with those people. There were four people he met with every day. H.R. Haldeman, his chief of staff, John Ehrlichman, also a head of his, um, one of the heads of his staff, and Henry Kissinger. Those were the only people he met on a daily basis. He spent many of his days sitting in a rocking chair in a, ro in a room off of the Oval Office where in a robe and jacket, he would make notes on a yellow legal pad. Frequently, they were repetitious notes. We, ha we have copies of all those notes. It's where he thought about where he wanted to go and what he wanted to do. What was his legacy going to be? It was in the midst of <coughs> that kind of deliberation that Nixon came up with the idea of what would happen if I became the president who ended the isolation of the United States vis-a-vis -vis China? What if I were the person who created a new relationship of if not cordiality, at least respect and engagement with the Chinese. And totally secretly, without ever telling a Secretary of State, he sent Kissinger to Beijing, not the Secretary of State. He basically worked to the point where he makes that incredible trip to China and ends the complete polarization and isolation that's existed between China and the United States for, since 1947. Amazing. But one of the other things Nixon does is to obsess about his enemies and take notes on the people he needs to be worried about and to destroy. So simultaneously, he's thinking grand thoughts which are gonna change the world, and he's also thinking very crude, crass, negative thoughts about all the enemies he wants to get rid of. And it's out of that context that Richard Nixon decides that even though all the poll data says that his campaign against George McGovern in 1972 is gonna be an easy one to win, in fact, McGovern wins one state, that notwithstanding that, Nixon becomes obsessed with what they are up to. And so he authorizes Ehrlichman to hire a group of people who become known as the plumbers and the plumbers are the ones who break into Democratic headquarters and Watergate with Nixon's okay. And of course, the first break-in doesn't work, so they have to go back a second time, and the second time, they get caught. And some enterprising Washington Post reporter 
notices that one of those four is people, someone who works on the White House staff. And that's what leads, well after the election of 1972 is over, to the hearings on Watergate that ultimately lead to the impeachment process and the demise of Richard Nixon's presidency. All this going back to the lonely child who wants to be by himself and who is simultaneously thinking grand thoughts but also very crass thoughts. It's, a pretty, it's just an extraordinary story. It's just an amazing story. Uh, someone who could have been one of the best presidents who ends up being largely uh, ignored and seen to be uh, a failure, a complete failure. Just think about where he's sitting in that yellow legal pad and all the times he looks through what he can achieve with places like China and what he can achieve by defeating his enemies even if he has to use illegal activities. So, the personal and the political. <coughs> Which brings us to Bill and Hillary. I'll start with Bill briefly. Bill is born, supposedly full term, 6.6 .6 pounds. Uh, only his alleged father, Bill Blythe, was in Vietnam nine months before he was born and didn't come back for another month. Virginia, his mother, had a very complicated childhood and was a very complicated person who loved to interact with a great number of men. She was dramatic. She had black hair with a white streak down the middle. She wore clothing which would be described as sexy. Uh, she was known for going to bars, dancing, celebrating. Um, she was actually, she left her home and left Bill to, to the care of her grandparents, or of her parents rather, uh, in order to get a nursing degree. And then came back two years later and married Roger Clinton. Roger Clinton was an alcoholic. Roger Clinton was uh, uh, verbally abusive. And Roger Clinton beat up Virginia. Bill becomes involved in protecting his mother and basically keeping his father, his step stepfather, from saying, you will never touch her again. Bill is, on the one hand, a fairly aggressive social being uh, who uh, goes to Washington, D.C. as a uh, representative of the uh, junior members of the American Legion, and that's where he first meets John F. Kennedy. Um, and he's someone who has an, an incredibly aggressive intellect and very social personality who dates widely. And once he gets to college, he goes to Georgetown instead of going to school in Arkansas because he knows going to Georgetown is a step beyond. Uh, and he goes to Georgetown, and at the end of that period at Georgetown begins his period of having multiple relationships with, with women. He then goes as a Rhodes Scholar to England, where he manages to find a way to avoid the draft in Vietnam, but without ever engaging in uh, overt anti-war activities. Then comes back and begins a series of uh, relationships, and he eventually goes to Yale Law School where he meets a woman student named Hillary. Now in some ways, Hillary is even more compelling in her personality than Bill is. Hillary grows up in a affluent suburb of Chicago. Her father owns his own business. Her mother is an incredible person. Uh, her mother basically was completely mistreated as a child. 
uh, sent back by her parents from the West Coast to Chicago with a three-year-old brother because they didn't want anything to do with her anymore, was then mistreated by her grandmother, and only after she goes to work for the person who becomes her husband does her life straighten out. Her husband is not very good to her, although Hillary never acknowledges this in her own book. Um, frequently threatens her. And Dorothy, the mother, essentially says, we will do everything we need to do in order to hold this family together. And her primary lesson to Hillary is, never, ever, ever let your family dissolve. No matter what happens, you need to keep your family together. Her mother is a devout Methodist, and even though the father is a Goldwater Republican, the mother believes in the social gospel and sends her daughter to the Methodist Youth Fellowship and her church. There, she is converted to the idea of the social gospel. We should change the world the way Jesus wants us to change the world. And she becomes particularly engaged in issues of race, women's rights, and children's rights. So even though when she's in high school, she's doing volunteer work in Chicago and going with her minister to Chicago. Her minister, by the way, is someone who she corresponds with and remains in touch with his ent you know, her entire life until he dies uh, in, the in the early 20th century. That's what she brings with her when she goes to Wellesley College, a commitment to social change, to the social gospel. And so even though she's the head of the Republican Party at Wellesley College in her first year, She's doing volunteer work in Roxbury, which is the poor black community in Boston. And she's working with, again, children and women's rights as well as civil rights. She reaches out to people. She doesn't make enemies. She doesn't build bridges. I mean, build walls. She builds bridges at Wellesley College. Works with people in power to make change happen. That's when she begins to meet Marion Wright Edelman and the Children's Defense Fund. And then she goes to Yale Law School, which I want you to think about this as, this is the early 1970s. There are not that many women going to law school in the early 1970s. She's one of them. And there she meets Bill. Uh, they fall in love. Bill has been looking for someone to be with on a long going basis for a long time without success. Hillary has had boyfriends, but never anyone like Bill. They fall in love, and they stay together through law school, including spending some time in California one summer when she's working for a law firm out there. <coughs> Hillary's campaign in politics begins with her work for McGovern in 1972. She's working in Texas in one place, and Bill's working in another place in Texas. Her roommate at that point says, you know, Hillary, you should become the first woman president. You are so talented. And Hillary takes her seriously, but she's also still in love with Bill. She actually, when Bill first runs for Congress in 1974, she comes to, she, she leaves what she's doing, which is working uh, for the impeachment committee in the Congress, and comes to Arkansas. One of the reasons she comes to Arkansas is because she heard that Bill's seeing somebody. Um, and actually, this is a fascinating thing because as soon as Hillary comes in, the woman that he's been seeing is escorted out by the staff. Uh, so they won't c come into contact with each other and eventually uh, that woman is no longer a part of Bill's life. Um, and she stays with Bill and he proposes to her twice and she says, I'm not sure I want to do this. And then finally she comes to the conclusion that if she's gonna make the changes in her life and the world's life that she really wants to do, there's a better chance of they're doing it together as a couple than if she were to go off on her own and try to chart this course as a, an independent woman, a feminist. And so they get married. Bill's elected attorney general of the state and then he's elected as governor. She's with him all the time. She basically is helping to save his campaign um, and 
He, in the meantime, is continuing his peripatetic life, uh, not really digging in his heels as a governor, and alienating a lot of the people who voted for him. And so his, to his everlasting surprise, he's defeated when he runs for re-election. Hillary is the one who comes to his rescue. She makes sure that his life is organized around certain issues. She brings in someone named Dick Morris, who you all may have seen on Fox television, uh, a political genius at organizing people, someone who I actually knew and worked with in New York politics. And Dick Morris helps to bring order and discipline to the campaign and Bill's elected governor two years after he's defeated and elected four times again thereafter. One of the things that is, begins to happen here is that whenever Hillary saves Bill from disaster, she gains more power because in response, he is willing to give her authority she did not have before. And so when he is reelected, the biggest issue before the state of Arkansas is educational reform. And he asks Hillary to head up an education reform task force. She puts together a bunch of experts that go all over the state, they have hearings, they listen to all the expertise they can get, and they pass some of the most significant education reforms that Arkansas ever saw. Now in the meantime, Bill is continuing his habits. At one point, he's considering running for president in 1988, and he's about ready to make his announcement when his chief of staff, who was a good friend of Hillary's, goes into his office and said, Bill, what are you gonna do about this issue of women? And she has a list of 30 women he slept with in the last four years. And he adds five more people to that list. And he decides that maybe she's right. Maybe this is not a good time to run for president. But four years later, he does run for president. And of course, when he runs for president, that's when he's doing so well, campaigning across the country, and the Jennifer Flowers story breaks in which Jennifer Flowers talks about having a 12-year affair with Bill Clinton. Clinton's numbers plummet in the polls. And Hillary says, we need to take this to the, to, to the nation at large. And so at her suggestion, they agree to be interviewed on 60 Minutes right after the Super Bowl. A huge audience. And she goes on there with Bill and she says, you know, I love this person. We love each other. Like all married couples, we have had our problems but we are going to stay together and love each other for the rest of our lives. Immediately, that has a huge impact. Bill is saved. He then starts talking about Hillary as his co-president and as two for the price of one. She now has a level of influence and power she's never had it before. And so when he takes over the White House, she becomes the first first lady to have an office right next door to the president and right next door to the vice president. Each of them has a staff of 20 or 30 people. They all are basically, it's a tripartite regime. They all have to sign off on everything. And Hillary becomes the person who chooses, as she did in Arkansas, to be in charge of the major initiative of the Clinton administration, which is health care reform. And she is totally in charge of that for the entire year. She does many other things, including barring the press corps from the White House, from entry to into the White House, firing the White House travel staff, and refusing to consult with congressional leaders on health care, but that's beside the point. Um, most importantly, when David Gergen works out a deal with the Washington Post to, to release all the whitewater papers uh, to the Washington Post that they will review them impartially, Hillary says, no, we can't do that because those papers contain evidence that as a lawyer, she sometimes, sometimes overbuilt her clients. So Hillary's become territorial. She's become not the person who reaches out and builds bridges, but becomes very much in control of her own domain. And even though at the end, Republican 
senators are willing to sign and agree to a health care bill that will give the Clintons 95% of what they want. Hillary says no, and we insist that Bill, in the State of the Union address, uh, go before the Congress and say that he will never accept anything less than 100%, and he will veto anything else. Now, in some ways, Hillary goes back to the first Hillary, the Hillary, Hillary who is building bridges and reaching out to people and listening to people when she runs for the Senate in New York. She goes all around the state listening to people, talking, what do you think, what do you think? Uh, and to some extent, she continues that in Congress and becomes very much a good friend of a lot of the people who are in the news these days, like John McCain and Lindsey Graham. But then there's the territorial Hillary, the one who basically wants to exist in complete control and not to share the earlier Hillary that we're talking about. And so one of the things that happens when she's running for president is which Hillary is going to show up? Which Hillary is going to show up? And one thing I would point out is that during that campaign, the only time Hillary talks about her religious experience and the importance of the Bible to her is in her concession speech the day after she loses the election. What would have happened if she talked about her religious faith with all those people out there who would relate in some ways to her religious faith and might be able to listen to her in a different way than they did. All of which brings us to Mr. Trump. Someone who also had a very, very interesting childhood. Raised by a father who insisted on challenging people, breaking deals, going to court, um, basically ratcheting up as much profit as he could by taking advantage of other people. When Donald Trump becomes an entrepreneur himself, he imports immigrant employees from Poland, pays them $5 an hour wages, uh, and essentially then gets rid of them as soon as the project is completed. He is sued by African Americans who try to get access to some of the apartments and condominiums he has built. He refuses to uh, go to trial, settles out of court, but the fact that he settles out of court means that in some respects the evidence suggests that he in fact had been able to do that. We know what we saw in a lot of the films that were shown about his relationship to women and I'm not going to use any of the terrible phrases that were part of that film. He's someone who, during the campaign, according to press accounts, 75% of what he said was suspect, whereas only 25% of what Hillary said was suspect. It doesn't say very much for either one of them, but no, on the other hand, three times more often than Hillary, uh, he was either, either deluding the truth or telling lies. Everyone will have their own view of Donald Trump. There are two Donald Trumps, really, just like there are two Hillary's. Uh, there's a Donald Trump that the press exposed as telling all these lies and saying these things were, were misleading, if not outright deceitful. And there's a Donald Trump who spoke on behalf of the anger, anguish, distress, of millions of American people who felt they were not being paid attention to. The second Donald Trump that, who spoke on behalf of all those people, many of us never even saw or didn't recognize. Without going into detail on much of the presidency, I'm going to focus on Charlottesville and the demonstration that took place there and the fact that Donald Trump basically equated neo-Nazis and Ku Klux Klaners with protesters from the peace and civil rights movement who were countering those demonstrations. To many people, what Trump seemed to be doing was to uphold the legitimacy of those 
neo-Nazis, and those conservatives. Most people, many people in the administration agreed with that. In an unprecedented set of statements, five chiefs of the armed services, the Army, the Navy, the Marines, the Air Force, and the National Guard, all made public statements condemning racism in the demonstrations that had taken place. Mitch McConnell, the Senate Republican leader, denounced hatred and bigotry. Mitt Romney, presidential candidate in, 19, in, in, in 2012, criticized Trump for causing racists to rejoice, quote unquote. Whether he intended to or not, he said, what Trump communicated caused racists to rejoice, minorities to weep, and the vast heart of America to mourn. Our allies around the world are stunned and our enemies celebrate. Senator Corker recently described the White House as an adult day care center and talked about the fact that this president lacked the competence and stability to be president. John McCain, in his recent speech, for the most part, agreed, as did Senator Flake yesterday. And so we are in a situation which is really unprecedented, in which half the positions that the White House controls are not filled yet, um, and where 27 psychiatrists have written a book saying that Trump is psychologically unfit to be president. We are in a situation unlike any we've ever been in before. So we have five stories here of five different people and the way in which their personal lives have shaped our politics and are shaping our politics. It's therefore important that we come to grips with the meaning of what personal experience means for politics and then we look very carefully and hopefully have a future of being able to look carefully at the political system which we celebrate but which is now in grave danger. Thank you.